Hi everyone, welcome to the video on the Unit 5 Most Missed Topics from Kinetics. Topic 5.2 was the most missed for our class's progress check, but I am going to cover just a couple other topics as well because I think that those will be prevalent on this year's exam. So just a review of Unit 5. Again, Unit 5 of the AP Curriculum is Kinetics. If you have not taken a look at each of these individual topics, I recommend going back and just looking at each one of them individually to see where maybe you might need to review more. The first part of Kinetics was looking at reaction rates, introduction to rate laws, how to write a rate law, and thinking about how concentration changes over time, looking at graphs as well as the different rate laws and order of reactants and overall reaction order. Then we looked at elementary reactions and went into some of the more conceptual understanding with the collision model. And then 5.6 and 5.10 were actually not on the progress check. That was reaction energy profiles, so reaction diagrams. So we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about that. And then it continued with 5.7 looking at mechanisms and looking at reaction mechanisms and writing the rate law, and then also looking at what happens if you have a slow step as the first step or a fast step as the first step. And finally, it ended with catalysts and what happens when you add a catalyst to a reaction. So we're going to start looking at a combination of topics, uh, 5.1 and 5.2, because that was where it was the most missed. So 5.2 was technically the topic that was most missed, but specifically it was questions 25 and 26, and that kind of combined these two together. So I want to talk just a little bit about each of these. The most missed question had to do with rate of appearance and rate of disappearance, which is the very first thing that we talked about when we talked about kinetics. So when you are looking at the rate of change of reactants or of products, you're looking at either the rate of appearance of products or the rate of disappearance of reactants, you had to look at the stoichiometry of a balanced equation. So if you were looking at two reactants going to one product, that means that the reactants are disappearing twice as fast as the products are appearing. So it's really important that you're looking at the terms appearance, disappearance, because if you see those, that means you need to look at the stoichiometry of the reaction given. There are a few different factors that affect rate. So you could look at concentration, temperature, surface area, or a catalyst. Notice that concentration is specific to reactant concentration. Product concentration isn't going to affect the reaction rate because products aren't in the rate law. We'll talk a little bit more about collisions a little bit later. When you are writing a rate law, so keep in mind that when you're writing a rate law, you need to use experimental data. So you would be given a table with concentrations and with rate and that helps you determine the rate law. So when you're looking at the rate law, this is a rate law, and it shows how the reaction rate is proportional to the reactant concentrations raised to a certain power. So when we're looking at this rate law, remember that typically your rate units are molar per second or molar per whatever unit of time, and then K is the rate constant. The rate constant is dependent on temperature and its units change based on the overall reaction order. So it's really, really important that you pay attention to K and important to remember that K will change when you change temperature. And then when you're looking at the reactant concentration, so notice how it's reactants only in the rate law. The reactant concentrations are the only thing that affect the reaction rate. When you have this M and this N, these are your superscripts, your exponents. This is the order with respect to the certain reactant. So M, is the reaction order with respect to x and n is the order with respect to y. You can add the exponents together to get the overall reaction order and that overall reaction order is what drives the units for k. So just a quick practice question. So this says that a chemist is studying the reaction between x and y2 as represented by the equation above. So make sure if it gives you an equation that you're paying attention to that equation. Then it says initial rates are measured and here is a table with different experiments. So we have two questions here. First, what's the rate law? And second, determine the rate of disappearance of x in experiment one. So let's start by looking at the rate law. So this is where we have to use the experimental data. So we have to use what is in this table. 
when you are determining the rate law, remember that you are looking at one reactant changing at a time. So if we're looking at X changing, that means I'm either going to look from 1 to 3 or 2 to 3, but Y needs to stay the same. So X changes in 2 to 3 when Y stays the same. And what we have to look at is how does X change and how does the rate change? So when X doubles, the rate doubles. If the rate changes the same way that your reactant concentration changes, then it's first order. We know that X is first order. If we look at Y changing, we want to keep X the same. So we're going to look from 1 to 2. When Y2 doubles, the rate doubles. So that's also first order. So when we write the rate law, it would be rate equals K. That's always how you start a rate law. Rate equals K times the concentration of X times the concentration of Y2. Notice that the rate law was not based on the reaction given. It's based on experimental data. This is not a mechanism. It's not an elementary step. And so we have to write our rate law based on experimental data. So rate equals K times the concentration of X times the concentration of Y2. Then the second question, based on the information above, determine the initial rate of disappearance of X in experiment one. So in experiment one, I'm only looking at this first row. Determine the initial rate of disappearance. So I know here I have initial rate of appearance of X2, Y2. I want to know the rate of disappearance of X. When you see rate of disappearance or rate of appearance, that means you have to look at the stoichiometry. If the rate of appearance of X2, Y2 is 32 molar per second, X has a coefficient that is twice as much as X2Y2, which means the rate of disappearance is twice as much as the rate of appearance. So the rate of disappearance of X is 64 molar per second. So remember, when you see rate of disappearance or rate of appearance, you need to look at the stoichiometry. So looking at topic 5.3, this is concentration changes over time. I'm not going to talk specifically about every single learning objective, but what I do want to point out is just this summary table that you need to make sure to either label on your equation sheet or make sure that you have this on your cheat sheet. So we have zero first and second order. You have the rate law and you have the units of the rate constant. Now notice here I put a little asterisk for units of the rate constant here. This lowercase t is just a unit of time. So it could be s, it could be minutes, could be hours. So just make sure that you pay attention to that. Then the integrated rate law. So the difference between the differential rate law and the integrated rate law is whether you are looking at rate versus concentration or concentration versus time. When you're looking at concentration versus time, you're using the integrated rate law, which is on your equation sheets. Label each one of those on your equation sheet if you do not have it labeled. Then you also need to be able to determine order when you're given a graph. So if concentration versus time is a straight line, it's zero order. If natural log of concentration versus time is is a straight line, it's first order. And if one over concentration versus time is a straight line, then it's second order. From that graph that gives you a straight line, you can determine the slope to figure out the rate constant. So that's what you're given in this table as well. And then it gives you the half-life equations. The only half-life equation you need to know is that of first order. And here's why down here. Half-life is so, so important for a first order reaction because the half-life is constant. So if you have a question that says, how do you know this is a first order reaction? And you are given a graph graph of concentration versus time, you can see what the half-life is because it's concentration versus time. So if the half-life is 10 minutes and then 10 minutes and then 10 minutes, it's constant. That tells you it's first order. So in a first order reaction, the half-life is constant. Then you have the equation T1 half equals 0.693 over K. Just always check your units. If K is a unit of per seconds, then your half-life should be in seconds. If K is in per minutes, your half-life is in minutes. So always just double check that. So reaction energy profiles, this was 5.6 and 5.10, uh, which looked at reaction energy profiles and then multi-step energy profiles. This was not part of the progress check, so I just wanted to make sure to talk about it because it was uh, conceptual. So with these energy profiles, if you remember in class, we looked at, we just called them energy diagrams. It showed our reactants going to the transition state and then forming products. And depending on the difference in energy between reactants and products, it could be either an exothermic or an endothermic reaction. And it also helped us 
to see the activation energy. So you have the reaction progress on the x-axis, you have the energy on the y-axis. So if we take a look at this graph up in the corner, we have reactants, it goes through to the transition state or the activated complex, and then it forms products. Notice how products are lower in energy than reactants. That means the reactants had to lose energy to become products. If it loses energy, if energy is released, it's exothermic. So if products are lower in energy, it's going to be an exothermic process. Then the energy from the reactants up to the transition state is the activation energy. So the higher the activation energy, the longer that reaction will take to occur. The smaller the activation energy, the faster it will occur. If we look at the second one, notice how products are higher. And so to go from reactants up to products, it has to gain some energy. So this is an endothermic process. And then you can see that this graph, this reaction profile, has a much higher activation energy. And then the last thing that was part of topic 5.6 was the Arrhenius equation. So the Arrhenius equation relates the rate constant to the activation energy and temperature. So the Arrhenius equation relates the temperature dependence of the rate of an elementary reaction to the activation energy needed by the molecules in order to reach that transition state and then become products. You do not have to do calculations with the Arrhenius equation. You just need to know that the Arrhenius equation allows us to relate the rate constant to the activation energy and temperature. So now looking back to collision theory, here's where I think you will have a lot of explaining with kinetics. So the collision theory is what allows us to determine how a reaction will occur, whether it will be fast or whether it will be slow, and why. The why is really important. So there is this diagram here that is from a website called Compound Chem, and this shows the different factors to increase the rate of a chemical reaction. So the collision theory just kind of explains why and how it works. So why uh, increasing concentration increases the rate, why increasing temperature increases the rate. This graphic would be a very, very good thing to either add to your cheat sheet or to just make sure that you understand. So with the collision theory, if you notice here, kind of pulled this graphic out. Uh, in order for a reaction to occur, it needs two things. The reactants need two things. They need correct orientation and they need enough energy to overcome activation. So they have to collide with the correct orientation to make sure that you have the correct products being formed. So if you notice here, if you want them to form, so let's say we have two, we have CO and NO and we need it to form, you know, NO2 or CO2, you know, whichever one. If they collide in this first orientation, the reaction will not occur because it's not the correct orientation for certain bonds to be broken and certain bonds to be formed. So they have to make sure that they collide in a correct orientation for the reaction to occur. They need enough energy because they need to overcome the activation energy. So that is the collision theory. Right? In order for reaction to occur, they must collide with correct orientation and sufficient energy. And so when you are talking about why a rate increases or why a rate decreases, you want to make sure that you're talking about the collision of the reactant molecules, not just collision of molecules. Make sure you specify the reactant molecules. And so this shows you why increasing concentration helps to increase the rate, why increasing surface area helps to increase the rate. So make sure that you read through this, make it yourself make yourself familiar with it. That way you're able to explain successfully. Finally, how to make sure you don't miss points on free response questions related to kinetics. So make sure that your rate law only includes reactants. Make sure that you include K. Don't forget your rate constant. And make sure that if it tells you to calculate K and it says include units, make sure you include units. Don't forget that part of it. Um, remember that specific parts of the molecules must collide. So try to not just say the collision must occur in the correct orientation. Right? Make, try to be specific. So specific parts of the molecules must collide in order for the reaction to occur. And then make sure that you are showing rate determining steps. You're explaining how a rate determining step is what drives the rate law of a a reaction mechanism. So try to be as specific as possible. That way you are getting maximum number of points.